Today we have uh, Luc Abadi, professor at Sorbonne University, professor of ecology. He will talk about biodiversity. It's, uh, it's an opportunity because we won't have so many opportunities to talk about the biodiversity in the courses. So thanks, uh, thanks for coming here. You have one hour, then we'll discuss mm -hmm. more or less depending on the questions. Okay. Okay, thank you and uh, good afternoon. Uh, so I'm going to speak of biodiversity. As you can see, my English is far from perfect. So if I am not clear, stop me. Uh, okay, voila. <laughs> uh, and the title of my talk is what biodiversity means. Uh, that I want to come back on the concept of biodiversity to go deep into the concept and to see what we can use in this concept for the management of nature and, and so on. So my starting point is not very original. No. No. So I come back to the definition of the convention on, on biodiversity. And in this uh, definition, we say that biological diversity means the variability among living organisms from all sources, including inter alia, terrestrial, marine, and other aquatic uh, ecosystem, and the ecological complex of which they are part. This includes diversity within species, between species. Now, within species, that means uh, genetic diversity, in fact. Huh? and the diversity of ecosystems. So the three important words in this definition are, of course, variability. The question is, what is this variability? What is the origin of this, of this uh, variability? And what are the consequences of this variability? The word between also is very important because we are going to talk of interactions uh, between different entities. And ecological complex, uh, in fact, uh, this means that we have systems with many components and a lot of interactions. So the traditional way to see biodiversity is to count the number of species, as you know, and more or less <laughs> now. The word biodiversity uh, means only, very often, the number of species. So if you look at this uh, table, we have the number of species we know today in different groups, species of animals, of plants. At the moment, we know uh, around 2 million uh, species. And when I say we know, in fact, that means that we don't know. <laughs> uh, we know for 1,000 species, we have a name, of course, we have a description, we have a specimen in a museum, but what is the function of these species in the ecosystem? We don't know. So in fact, we, we know rather nothing about uh, biodiversity. And of course, we have some knowledge on the big organisms, but we lack of information on the small organisms. The real number of species could be around 10 million. Uh, we don't exactly know, but probably 10 million. And maybe much more because, of course, with microorganisms, we have a very, very high diversity. And the concept of species for microorganisms is not very uh, interesting. It's more or less uh, wrong. But now the question for today is, OK, we have probably 10 million species, but why 10 million? Why not only 1 million or 1,000 or only a single species? This is a question. What is the mechanism leading to so much variability in the living uh, world? If we have a look to the past of, of the planet, <coughs> we have some data about, for example, the number, or not of species, but of marine families. Uh, and you see that this number, or this number is 
the difference between the number of species that are disappearing now and the number of species that are appearing now. It's a, a balance between two opposite processes, of course. So this balance is very variable with time. Huh? You see, uh, uh, we have here 600 million years in the past. We have some moments where the decrease of biodiversity is much higher than the increase. So we have what we call uh, a crisis, an a period of extinction of species. Probably we had 60, we know now, 60 period of extinction with five major periods. And you know the, the last one uh, at the Cretaceous, uh, where we, we have lost uh, the dinosaurs and so on. But the most important decrease was at, during the Permian. At this moment, probably, we have lost 80, 90% of all the species. But this loss took one million years. You see the scale. And the comeback to the former situation took one or more or less 100 uh, million years. So it is very important, of course, to have, in the end, the time scale of the dynamic of biodiversity. If you have a look on what happened on the continents, we have, of course, the same process. As the same process. We, have, we see an increase of the number of species for plants, for insects, for vertebrates. And you see also the, the shape of the curve. It is more or less exponential. We see that the rate of the differentiation of life is increasing with time. So what is happening? How can we explain this very um, uh, strong trend of the life to uh, be more and more diverse and more and more rapidly? This is what I am I'm going to try to show you. What are the mechanisms behind? I'm going to take an example with two birds to not hatch, uh, small bird, uh, okay. And these birds can be found uh, in different areas, in the Middle East and in the Balkans, in Europe. And in fact, we have two situations. The first situation is when the two birds arrive in uh, different places. So they cannot meet because they are in two different places. And the other situation is when the two birds arrive in the same area. That means that they can, they can uh, meet. Uh, they can meet. And so on this picture, we have studied uh, the ecological niche of the species. In fact, the uh, traffic, the food component of the ecological niche. And for that, people measured simply the size of the prey uh, the bird eat, the size of the insect, for example. So here we have the size of the, the size of the prey and the frequency of the size of the prey that are consumed. Okay. And when the two birds live in two separate areas, we see that more or less they eat the same type of, uh, of food the same size of insect. That means that there is an overlap between the two uh, ecological niche and potentially we can have competition between these two birds for the access to the food. When they live in two separate areas, there is no possibility of competition, not at contraire. Excuse me. <laughs> this situation is when uh, they live in separate areas. This is what I said before. Wait a second. Okay. Second situation, they live in the same area. So in this case, there is a possibility of competition. We have seen that before. And so what we see 
in the real world is that they change their ecological niche. And one of the species is going to be more, to be a specialist of big prey, and the other one is going to be a specialist of small prey. And in this condition, the risk of competition, and we have a real risk, we have seen that here, so there is only a small competition, a small risk of competition. So the first uh, thing important to understand that when we have competition, very often the response of the organisms is to decrease the risk of competition, in fact, the intensity of competition. So why do they do that? Of course, each organism has only a limited amount of energy. And this energy is used for different functions. Parce que je bouge trop. C'est bon. Merci. Yes. So uh, each uh, species, each organism, has only a limited amount of energy, and this energy must be shared between different functions. You have to, you need energy to uh, uptake the resource, to find the resource. You need energy for your metabolis metabolism. The metabolism is the growth, the maintenance of cells, the defense. Uh, sometimes you, you create reserves. And of course, you have uh, the reproduction. What does it mean, reproduction? It means the production of new individuals. And of course, if you take into account the evolutionary time, the ability of an organism to produce a certain number of descendants is a key point for the maintenance of the species on the long term. In fact, when we speak of adaptation, <coughs> practically what we do to measure, uh, to evaluate, to assess the adaptation of organisms, we measure the ability to produce descendants. This is a sort of a summary of all what happened to an organism, okay? So if you have this uh, figure in the end uh, about the, uh, the trade-off, uh, the compromise we have to find between different needs, it's a key point in ecology. It's a major concept in ecology, trade-off. It's easy to understand that if you put a lot of energy, for example, in a defense or maintenance, you have less energy for reproduction, and in this case, you are on a very uh, uh, negative uh, <laughs> condition. And you, you, you have a risk of, uh, uh, of decrease of the size of the population, of the, of the number of organisms. And eventually, you are on the road of extinction. So it is not possible from an, from an evolutionary point of view. Okay? So in fact, uh, the response of the organism to competition is to decrease the intensity of competition in order to keep enough energy for reproduction. And, for example, if you, are, if you are in competition for food, you change a bit the type of food you use, so you reduce the intensity of competition, and you can invest in your reproduction. Okay? So, of course, it's... A, traditional mechanism of evolution. Uh, we, you have some mutation at random. Sometimes this mutation is positive, allow, for example, to change of the size of the prey, and it's OK. It's uh, kept by evolution. Uh, there is a, a selection of this type of, uh, of change, and you decrease the intensity of competition. So the response to competition by the species is a decrease of competition because the cost of competition is paid very often by your loss of the capacity to reproduce and to maintain in the long term. Okay? Of course, in the case of the birds, 
probably, I don't exactly know in fact, but probably if the two birds who are living together, you separate these two birds, maybe they will come back to the former food region. Maybe, I don't know. It's, it's a possibility. That means that this is reversible. You can come back to the former situation. But if you maintain this situation of competition on the long term, it will uh, become a definitive response because you will select a different part of information, of genetic information. And in fact, it, we have many examples of that. Huh? Uh, one of the most famous examples is uh, in Galapagos, uh, observed by uh, Darwin, about, uh, about, about, uh, come on, this are really Finch. <laughs> about the Finch. So the story is very well known. So first of all, Darwin imagined the story. And he was right. And now we have a proof of that with molecular biology. We are able to, to draw uh, phylogeny. Uh, <coughs> and the story is very simple. Three million years ago, uh, a finch came from the continent South America to the Galapagos. At the beginning, everything was perfect because there was, of course, a low density of birds a lot of resources, so the size of the population increased, and of course, we had a beginning of competition for food. And through the mechanism of mutation, of traditional uh, selection, uh, Darwinian selection, the finches began to, uh, to be more specialist. Some live on the trees, others on the soil, some eat big seeds, other small seeds, and so on. And three million years later, you have 14 true species that are not in competition. Okay. So you see that on the time of evolution, this interaction through competition, but there is not only competition, I will give another example, uh, the only possible response on the long term is to decrease the competition. And so you produce new organisms. Finally, you increase the diversity. We had one bird, now we have 14. Okay. So when you, saw, when you have this concept of uh, trade-off, if you understand this concept of trade-off, you understand that life cannot be constant. And that the change are uh, well, ça, je pas le dire, inévitable. <laughs> <laughs> voilà. <laughs> uh, bah. Il y a des choses qui n'arrivent pas à dire. <laughs> Alors, of course, there is a competition, but not only the competition, there is also the cooperation, for example. Another <laughs> story, a very funny story, once more with Darwin. This guy is incredible. <laughs> so, in Madagascar, ici, uh, this. Uh, <coughs> Orchid, but this orchid is very special. If you look, you see that here we have some tubes uh, between, uh, well, between 20 and 30 centimeters long. And these tubes are very common organs for flowers. They are what we name the nectary. This is the place where, where the flowers produce Nectar, that nectar is a sugar in water, more or less. And this nectar, of, of course, is uh, produced to attract the insect. The insects go on the flower. They, uh, they take, I don't know how to say it, they charge the. They take some pollen and they go, well, they, they help the flower to disperse uh, in the space. So, here we have nectar. And Darwin said, OK, so it must exist. It must exist. It must. An animal able to uptake this nectar here. And so he, predict, he made a prediction. He says there is a butterfly with a long trump that is able to 
takes the nectar. But he has never seen the butterfly. And 10 or 12 years later, another biologist, Wallace, it was a competitor of, uh, of Darwin, uh, Wallace discovered the butterfly. And this butterfly has a very long trump, <laughs> able to take up the nectar in the tube. And so clearly now we, saw, we, we know that it was a progressive adaptation of the flower and of the butterfly. Uh, sometimes the tube was a little bit longer. Uh, a few moments after, the, the trump of the butterfly was a little more longer and so on. And it is very interesting because it is a win-win situation. Because the butterfly has no competitor for the access to nectar. This butterfly is the only organism able to have uh, this trump and uh, able to, to obtain the nectar. Uh, random side question. Why did the flower adapt in a way that the nectar is really <laughs> hard to get? Uh, yeah. They don't adapt. There is, no, there is no plan. If you have a, a, a mutation at random that makes uh, the tube, the, the nectary, a little bit longer. And if you have another mutation in a butterfly with a longer trump, the process is started. And you don't see any reason to, to stop the process, in fact. Okay? There is no plan, no intention at all. It's a question of uh, mutation at random. So that means that in this case, it is not a common case, of course, because we must have mutations more or less coordinated, coordinated in time. But coordinated, coordinated in time from evolution, that means uh, maybe uh, over uh, 10 or 20,000 years. Huh? So we, we have many occasions to, to have a, a <coughs> common adaptation, in fact. So the butterfly has no competitors, but co since this butterfly go only on the flower of this plant species, all 100% of the pollen go from the good individual to another good individual of the same species. So the dispersion of the flower is very high. So it's a very, uh, this close cooperation finally uh, between these two uh, organisms uh, give a very uh, great advantage in terms of food or dispersion. But of course, if one of the two partners disappear, the situation is very bad for the other. And it is very interesting <laughs> because you see that at short term, this strategy is very uh, positive, but it is very risky on the long term. And it is absolutely possible that today, one of the two partners disappear, and probably the other will disappear also. So uh, you have many other mechanisms that uh, produce this differentiation on this, uh, well, of the organisms, and it is one of the mechanisms producing this whole variability. And finally, if we come back to the concept of uh, trade-off, very often when we speak of adaptation, the question is, yes, is this adaptation good? It is, is it the better adaptation and so on? In fact, <laughs> this has no sense, because the different trade-offs are possible. And in a sense, these 10 million species are 10 good compromise, 10 good uh, uh, trade-off, finally. Okay? <coughs> so uh, when you speak of biodiversity, good, bad, it depends on the, sc on the scale you, you take into account. Finally, it's, it, has not, uh, it has no sense. We have also many other examples of cooperation. Uh, probably something very, very important is a cooperation between plants through the root, this is root, and the fungi. And we know, for example, today that uh, for the uptake of water, the uptake of phosphorus, of nitrogen in the soil, at school, people say uh, the plants use their roots 
to uptake water and phosphorus. It is wrong. Plants, in fact, they don't, they don't do the job. The job is done by the fungi. And so, in fact, the plant gives sugar, uh, organic molecules, to the fungi, because from a physiological point of view, fungi is more or less an animal. It's not able to uh, change CO2 into organic compounds, okay? And since the fungi is very small, it is able to explore all the soil and to uptake. Uh, and all now we know that uh, all the, the, the nutrition of plants for water and nutrient, nutrients is done by fungi. Just another example, absolutely incredible. Uh, a, a team uh, 20 years ago made an experiment. They took two trees, one conifer and one broadleaf uh, tree. Uh, they connect these two trees by a network of one species of fungi. They put one tree in the light the other in the shadow, the tree in the light has transferred carbon coming from the photosynthesis to the tree in the shadow. And what is absolutely incredible in this case is that at the same time, you can have two trees in collaboration in this case, but they can be also at the same time in competition for the access, for example, to water. So when we say, well, there is competition, there is uh, this is very important to explain biodiversity. No, 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 it's cooperation. We can explain many things for biodiversity. In fact, uh, probably we have all that at the same time mixed in nature. Uh, of course, well, probably in the case of the two trees, the trees in the shadow transfer nitrogen and phosphorus to the tree in the light. And so in this case, it is win-win because we can adjust the ratio between organic carbon, phosphorus, and so on. Well, uh, okay. ah. <coughs> le folklore n'est pas terminé. Well, uh, well so we, through this type of mechanism, but there is also sexual selection and so on, there are other mechanisms. Uh, we uh, reach uh, the, the result, the final result, is probably 10 million species. Okay, this is the first part of this grid variability behind the concept of uh, biodiversity. But, of course, in a given place, you have different species. And immediately, you have interactions. That means that this species is going to modify this one, and this one is going to modify the other. <coughs> And, uh, of course, very important interactions are through food. And we, uh, uh, we have, finally, the concept of trophic, trophic chain, food chain, uh, trophic network. And, in fact, if we look at the real world, this is an ecosystem. You have this big um, fish, a pike. Uh, this species uh, eat some other big fish. Themselves, they, they eat on uh, invertebrates, animal invertebrates, uh, plankton, vegetal plankton. <coughs> and we have something very complicated. In fact. And in fact, this is a quite simple situation. Another example, you have a duck. And it is it, it, <laughs> uh, in this network, a terrible network. Um, and the job of some ecologists is to try to, un to understand and to draw this network and to find some rules of the organization of this network. So uh, it's very important to understand that a species in, is in this network of different species. And from a concrete uh, point of view, practical point of view, that means that if you change something here, probably you will have many change elsewhere. And the big problem for 
research in ecology today, one of the big problems, is to be able to, uh, to model that and to predict uh, the result. And for example, when people say, yes, uh, you have to predict, uh, explain what will be the forest in one century if we have two degrees of change of climate change, <laughs> you have to solve this type of problem. So we are, we are far from the result. <laughs> so it's absolutely impossible today to make a prediction about what will be the ecosystems in, in one century. We can have a general idea, but not more. I just want to ask how general is the idea? So that I, I understand that it's hard to say, to predict exactly which species are going to be uh, bothered mm -hmm. by the consequences. But can we say, is it going to be total extinction or is it going to be... Uh, Alors, yes, for, for the extinction, we can say that we can evaluate the risk of extinction because in fact when you look at, at climate change uh, you have uh, a movement uh, in the northern hemisphere it is a, m a movement towards the north of the uh, climate uh, conditions uh, on average if you have one degree more on the uh, global temperature you have a movement of the climate areas of 150 kilometers on average in the north. For example, if you, if you say, okay, we will have three degrees at the end of the century, that means that the, the climate envelope are going to move off uh, around 450 kilometers. But the different species are only compatible with a given amount of water and a given temperature. So they are also to move. And we have data now uh, on 1,000 species over the world. We know the, the capacity of uh, dispersion. And of course, the result is that some species are not able to move rapid, rapidly, enough rapidly, to follow, finally, the movement of the climate. And of course, very often, it's the plants, for example. The trees are not able to move at high speed to follow this change. And this is the reason why you, you have a new, a new type of uh, research in ecology. Uh, we speak of, um, uh, assisted dispersion, more or less. Okay, the three are going to, to lose the race with climate. Okay, we take the trees and we, well, okay. For, for foresters, for example, it's a problem. What I put in my forest now. And so this is a very big problem. And we have no, it's complicated to, to give a good response because forest, uh, foresters want to, to, to introduce species coming from uh, the south of Spain or in, from Morocco, or I don't know. Okay, so they will be adapted maybe to climate in one century. But now you put them in an ecosystem where they were not. So there were not this type of co-evolution between this tree, the predators, the fungi, etc., etc. And the question is, what is the system? So we have good prediction for individual species, for example, for, 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 for birch or other trees. We know that in this area in France, it is not possible. It is not possible. It will be possible, for example, in the north of France. It is just a possibility from a climate point of, point of view, from the ecosystem point of view, from the, this question of interaction between many other organisms. Yeah, but, uh, we are not able to, to know exactly at the moment. <coughs> because <coughs> the, the big problem now is the rate of the change. The uh, rate uh, of the change? Of the climate change, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Maybe there are two questions. Well. First, uh, what does uh, Darwin, yeah? Darwin evolution say about this? Uh, do we have anything? I don't understand. Ah, what does Darwin 
Oh, but Darwin, uh, about climate change, uh, Darwin say nothing. <laughs> 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 no. But he say many things indirectly, since he speak of adaptation, of the link between, uh, of course. But the climate change was not really uh, a problem at uh, this point. Can we go back to his previous slide? Uh, yes. Which? Mm -hmm. Stuff like that. But what about these fish? Will they change their diet as well? Yes, of course they, they can. Because Partly. No, no, you are right. It's possible. It is exactly the, the, the example of the two uh, birds we have seen. They can do that, but in a limited range. And in fact. Uh, if I understand your question, you, are, you have more or less three types of response of organisms to the uh, rapid climate change. The first one is to move in space. You try to, to go northward, uh, for example, this is what we said before. The second response is that, in fact, when you look one species, you see that we have a lot of small difference between the different individuals of the same species. And sometimes this individual has a difference in the color of the, uh, of the color, or a small difference in, in its ability to, uh, to eat uh, something. And uh, the proportion of this individual in the total population is going to increase. For example, uh, we have in, I don't know how to say it, uh, <laughs> arrows. Uh, in Switzerland, uh, we have two two arrows. Oh, two, two holes. Yes, yes exactly. Uh, one is uh, cle uh, white, more or less, and other are dark. <coughs> what we see now is that the proportion of dark and white are changing. The proportion of white are decreasing. Because in fact, with the climate change, uh, the snow, we have less of snow during the, the year. So when you wear white on snow, it was very positive because predators couldn't see you. But if the length of the snowy period decreases, you are white in a dark area, in a dark environment. So the predators are changing the, their, uh, their prey. Well, so this is another response. This variability between the different individuals allow to survive if we have a climate change until a certain level. Okay. And after that, the, the third solution is mutation. And it is very long. And for example, a study has shown a, a few years ago that the ability to evolve in terms of acquisition of new characters through mutation for vertebrates, it's possible, of course. It has happened in the, story, in the history of, of the planet. But the rate of climate change is 1,000 times too rapid compared to the time of evolution of most of vertebrates. Well, so there is nothing new in terms of process. It is just a, process, a problem of, of uh, of uh, speed. Oui? So if I understand correctly, the projections of extinction, they are not based on, uh, to put very simply, they are not based on this complex system model, but on extrapolation. No, no, no. They are based only uh, on the climate envelope of... Uh, so it's a kind of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And after that, we can, of course, we can, we can model all that. We can. Uh, but so far, it has not. Well, been done. exactly. We we make prediction. Uh, we have some models showing that uh, if we have a very strong climate change, we increase uh, uh, the extinction rate at least locally, and maybe uh, globally. Well, another way to see biodiversity with practical uh, 
consequences is what uh, we have seen this uh, trophic web, uh, this complexity of, uh, of the food webs. Uh, so there is another example very interesting, the, the concept of trophic cascade. An experiment, you have uh, phytoplankton and plant, uh, small invertebrates, zooplankton, small fish and big fish eating small fish. And we make a manipulation uh, in controlled conditions with only these two organisms, with three or with four organisms. And we look at the, the amount of the plants. Why? Because, for example, you see, in fact, the, behind that, we have the, the concept of uh, eutrophication of water. Probably, you know what is eutrophication? It's an increase uh, in the number of uh, small algae. They are small algae. And so the water is becoming green with a low transparency. You have an explosion of plants. After that, the plants die. They die. Uh, they sink, they are decomposed. Decomposition means the consumption of oxygen. So you have levels of water without oxygen. This induces, of course, the high mortality of fish, for example. So we are very interested in the dynamic of the small algae. <coughs> so you have, well, voilà, donc, two traffic levels, three, Four. And we look at the density of the plants. If we have only plants and invertebrates, we have this level of plants. If we have this fish, we have this level. If we had another fish eating carnivorous fish, we have this level we see that the, the, the density of the algae depends on the organization of the whole system. And practically, that means that if you want to control the eutrophication of water in small lakes, for example, because people go in this lake and they swim, and, so on, and there is a camping be, uh, beside the lake, it is summer, vacation, and so on. But sometimes you have a, a, a very high density of this algae, we close the lake because there are some risks with, uh, with cyanophyce, uh, bacteria, and there is also norms of transparency of water. So if it is too green, we close the lake. But in fact, we have a solution to control that. If you manipulate the diversity of the fish, you can avoid this explosion of algae even if we have a strong supply of phosphorus and nitrogen, that is at the origin of eutrophication. So for at least half a century, we know how to control eutrophication of water in lakes, controlling the composition of fish, but we do not apply that. Voilà. This is an example of a knowledge in ecology that is available for a very long time, that is not really used as Oh, what, is, what is a good name? Through an, an eco, uh, ecological engineering approach, a nature-based solution approach, an ecosystem-based solution, uh, ecosystem-based approach. I don't know what is a good word. But we have many examples, in fact, where we know what we could do with biodiversity, biodiversity as a tool, and we don't really uh, use it. So if I come back to my complexity of uh, the system, uh, bon, another drawing. Of course, there are interactions between organisms, but there is also interaction between organisms and the physical world. When we speak of adaptation, bon, we have an organism, it changes a little bit, and it is still compatible with the environment. But sometimes, the best response to a bad environment is to change the environment. And if this is uh, what we, we call in ecology the building of ecological niche. We have many examples. Uh, termites change the environment, they, they, they build a big nest. 
And the result of that is that they uh, produce more descendant. The, it, if we have a, a closed nest, you have less predators and so on, and the production of descendants is better. So in some times, very often, in fact, and in many, many, a lot of cases, uh, the uh, organisms change the chemical and physical environment. And in fact, it is once more not av avoidable. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I, I, will, I will come back on that just after. Uh, so the change of environment, of physical environment, by living organisms. This is the reason why we believe that living organisms m can be tools for the management of the environmental crisis sometimes. With m well, uh, it's very dangerous, huh? okay? <laughs> we'll come back on that. But an example, incredible example. In Serengeti in, uh, in Africa, in Serengeti you have savannas, in the savannas you have grasses, and you have herbivores. Alors ça c'est des gnous, ça s'appelle comment des gnous Ben, je ne sais plus. Bon. <laughs> well, you know this type of herbivores. Uh, what is the name? Les gnous. Oui, c'est ça. Wild bees. Oui, c'est ça. Et... En fait, dans les 60s, il y avait une maladie, une peste, qui venait de... Uh, domestic cause and uh, the domestic cause uh, uh, produce a contamination and uh, the w these uh, herbivores were at a very low density and uh, they, they, they were able to uh, <coughs> to produce a treatment against this paste okay and so the first response was the increase of the population of the herbivores with a, a sort of stable number of, of uh, animals. This is what we, we call in ecology the carrying capacity. Uh, when you have a given environment with a given physical conditions and given other species, you have a sort of uh, equilibrium of the number of, uh, of individuals. This is a good example of that. So we have an increase on the stable population of herbivores. And of course, the herbivores do their work. Their work is to eat <laughs> grasses. So they decrease the amount of grasses on the soil. And in this type of uh, environment, of ecosystems, <coughs> we have fires each year. It's a normal situation. The fire is a normal situation in the savanna ecosystem. Uh, that's different for forest, of course. But savannas need ecosystems, there is a, a big co-evolution between fire and organisms in this type of ecosystem. So if you have less grass, because you have more herbivores, the intensity and frequency of fires decrease. <coughs> and the consequence of that is the increase of the trees, because of course, the young trees, when they are in the grass layer, with the fires, they are destroyed. If you have less fire in intensity, and less fire in frequency, the, survive, the survival of the young trees is better, and so you increase the tree cover. And if you make a calculation of the amount of carbon stored in the ecosystem, taking into account the vegetation and the increase in the soil, bah, you find something, I don't remember exactly, but between uh, 100 and 200 tons of carbon per hectare more with this increase of the herbivore population. So in this case, we see that just a biological problem, a pest and an herbivore, is a key driver of the amount of carbon in the system. And this is the reason why herbivores can be seen as tools to control more or less the carbon sequestration <coughs> over uh, very uh, large areas, in fact. Theory, theory. Theoretically, in theory, uh, it's possible to imagine to uh, manage herbivores differently in order to increase the accumulation of carbon in the ecosystem and, of course, 
to decrease uh, the accumulation in atmosphere. Why not? Another important with a pop on the well. Alors, this very simple uh, drawing, probably you know that. Another key message is that, of course, an ecosystem is always changing. Always. And the reasons are very simple to understand. Is here you have the traditional view of plant succession. You have an open uh, area. Some grasses arrive. After that, some small trees. If you take the situation in, uh, in Ile-de-France, the first big trees will be uh, birch, les bouleaux. And after that, you will have oaks, for example, and so on. But the question is, why is it changing? But in fact, it is very simple to understand. If you take, for example, the, the, the birch step, uh, when you have an open area, an open place, we have a lot of light. It is hot. And so the young seedlings of, of birch are adapted to this sunny and dry environment. So they grow, but when they grow, they intercept light and they begin to create humidity. So they are changing the conditions. And these conditions are becoming less favorable to the young trees. And at the moment, the young trees are in a wet and a dark environment, but they are adapted to a light and dry environment. So they die. And you cannot have a new birch. But of course, if you have some species adapted to this new situation, but they are going to uh, develop and so on. So in fact, what we have to understand is that the good condition for the establishment of one species will not last a very, a very long time because as soon as an organism is somewhere, it intercepts some resources, it consumes some resources, it changes the environment. Right. So once more, as we have seen for the evolution, the speciation and so on, it is impossible to imagine a stable ecosystem. A normal natural ecosystem is always changing. And the result is that, in a, for example, in a forest, now if you look at a natural forest, so to see that you have to, to go in the tropics. In Europe, we have no, more, uh, no longer uh, natural forest. But this is two hectares of forest, uh, of a tropical forest. But what we see, we see a mosaic of forest. Here, oh, I don't see really the difference between the colors. <laughs> For example, here you have a new clearing in the forest because an old uh, tree died and fall on the side. So once more, you have very dark and wet conditions everywhere. And crack, at this moment, you have a new condition with a sunny environment with high temperature and dryness. The species of the forest cannot establish here. It's impossible. But it is not a problem because we had another clearing area at 100 meters or 50 meters. And so the species go from this clearing area to the new clearing area. And it is true for the old steps of the development of the forest. So in fact, the a true forest is a mosaic of different forests coexisting on very small space. And of course, in this condition, you have a very high regional biodiversity. So this heterogeneity in space is a key condition for the ability of the forest to regenerate and to respond to perturbation. And when we grow uh, plantation, we have the same species, uh, we put them in the forest the same day, etc. It's absolutely not a real situation. So you decrease, in fact, the ability of the forest to respond to perturbations. So it's a key message because today, as you know, a forest is going to save the world. We are going to put trees everywhere, okay? Uh, but 
it would be better if we could follow some basic rules about the dynamic of the forest, uh, the mix of species, I will come back on that, etc., etc. And it is interesting for the biodiversity itself, but it is interesting also for the success of the strategy uh, we, uh, we uh, implement. Rapidly, because the time is uh, running, <laughs> of course, uh, I will not go into details because it's very complicated. I, um, it's a question of mathematics at the moment. <laughs> but if you have complex systems, oh, that means a lot of components linked by very uh, different interactions. If you have a change in the environment, for example, your climate warming, you will be very lucky if you have a linear response. You will have a non-linear response with different uh, shapes of the response, and this is also one of the reasons explaining why it is difficult to make predictions. This is the reason why we use model, mathem mat uh, mathematical models. And sometimes, as you, saw, as you, you see, you can have some collapse, huh? really, and a, ready, uh, <coughs> a drastic change of the ecosystem, and it is more or less not reversible. Of course, in nature, everything is reversible. It's a question of time. A good example, you have some very big fires in Australia uh, two or three years ago. The forest was destroyed um, on very huge areas. The soil was burned, the, the seeds were, were burned, etc. After that, the climate has not changed. So the forest could come back from a climatic point of view, but the forest doesn't come back. Why? Because you have created a new environment without resources, no nutrients in the soil, no seeds. And so the new organisms able to uh, uh, settle in this uh, new area, they are going to come from one, two, three hundred kilometers. It will take time. And this is the reason why we say that it is irreversible. So the f physical environment has changed drastically, but we have also a question of the source the, the sources of biodiversity. If they are too far from the, <coughs> the area, <coughs> nah, you, you, you wait. Uh, well. Alors, what are the consequences of biodiversity now? We have seen what it is, what we are supposed to take into account when we build policies about biodiversity. Uh, just before this meeting, uh, another meeting we, about uh, uh, nature-based uh, nature -based solutions. How can we uh, measure the efficiency of nature-based solutions? What I can say is that we are very far from what I explained before. Sometimes we count the number of species, but, well, not more. The diversi genetic diversity, for example, is not taken into account, etc. Bon, what are the consequences of the diversity? This number of species, and we come back to this traditional view of uh, diversity. Just after the conference of uh, Rio de Janeiro, uh, the question was, is the number of species important? Since we have a lot of species disappearing, is it a catastrophe or not? So people uh, made experiments uh, with a manipulation of the number of species. And the beginning of that was in, uh, in, the, in the US, in grasslands. So they created many different plots with 5, 10, 15 species of grasses and they measure the productivity. And we see that the, the productivity of the grass is increasing with the number of species. Now, of course, it increased uh, rapidly at the beginning uh, for a few number of species and after that you reach a sort of plateau. This is a problem because some people say, yes, if you look at the left part of the figure, you demonstrate that biodiversity is very important for productivity. Okay, but if you look at the right part of the drawing, 
yes, it is important, but after this number of species, if you add more species, there is no effect. So if I lose species, it is not a problem. We have too much species. Alors, I come back on that. Uh, bah, tout de suite, même. Voilà. But the question is that, in fact, if you now look, alors, th this result was confirmed with studies over different years. And after, if you look in details, the identity of the different species, for example, the first year, the species A is very dominant, uh, produce, I don't know, 50% of the total biomass. And the species B is very small, with a low production, a low contribution to the total production. But the following year, the situation is reversed. The first one is becoming very few, well, it's not very productive. And the second one has become very productive. Why? But I don't know, because uh, there was a very hot summer, a very uh, cold uh, winter, or, uh, a bacteria, uh, a pest, uh, voilà. and so in fact, uh, this is a key concept in biodiversity science. This is a concept of um, uh, biological insurance. This diversity, you can see this diversity as a sort of a library of potential solutions to different situations. And if you have a, good, a big library, you have more solutions, and you are more able to face different situation. And the same team in the US have also uh, studied uh, the resistance to perturbation, to dryness, and we have more or less the same situation, uh, more, uh, the, the more uh, species, the more resistance to dryness, that means uh, the, the production in a situation of dryness will not be, will not be very different of the production with water due to this mix of species. So uh, now we have uh, 30 or 40 years of studies about that, many experiments in the world. And in this paper uh, published uh, in 2015, I think, yes, sir, uh, you have a summary of, wef of what we know. The link between species, number of species, and the productivity is always positive. And the link between uh, number of species of grasses and the ability of these grasses, of this plant cover, to uh, resist to dryness is positive in many cases. There are uh, some exceptions. So I think that we can say now that for grass ecosystems, we know that more diversity at the level of species is positive for productivity and for resilience. And we should know that and we should apply this rule when we make ecological restoration or things like that. <coughs> I would like to say uh, the same uh, result for forest. It is not possible already. Because for forest, we have less experiments because it is longer, more complicated. But we have some studies of correlation. This one, for example, over rather 800,000 points in the world, quand même. on average, you have a link between the tree species richness, or the number of tree species, and the productivity the productivity of trees, the productivity of food. That means that it could be interesting from, for economy. And you see probably something that shows that we, we can, well, sometimes we can have a, a good combination. There is no opposition between biodiversity and economy. And we have one marvelous experiment in China they have made the same experiments than in the grassland. You create different plots with a different numbers of trees. You measure productivity, volume of, of wood, in fact. Huh? Once more, it can be seen as an economic uh, resource. And you have 
pardon, a positive relation uh, between this number of trips and uh, this uh, productivity. So we need to have more results to be absolutely sure, but very it's very probable that if you increase the diversity in forest, you increase uh, the productivity and probably the resistance to uh, uh, dryness. We know there is also a better resistance to pests. It has been demonstrated in the US, in Europe. Uh, well. Alors, what are the mechanisms behind this? It's so simple. But the basic mechanism is a question of, <laughs> uh, of sampling. If you have five species in a grassland compared to 20 species in a grassland, of course, you have three times more chance to have a species adapted to dryness, for example, when you have 20 species compared to the situation where you have only five species. What is adaptation to dryness, for example, it's uh, uh, deep roots. If you have deeper roots, you can uptake water in the deep soil and you will resist to dryness. And so if I have 20 species compared to five, I have, I have four uh, more chance to have this uh, species. This is a sampling effect. It's a statistical effect, I mean, really. So it's very easy to understand and to, to measure. And we have also some more complicated mecha mechanisms. One is a uh, facilitation. For example, if you have a high number of species, you can have a species able to fix atmospheric nitrogen, and we, you will have transfer of nitrogen to the other. So there is facilitation. And the uh, third category of mechanism is cooperation, close interaction between species. And of course, uh, many things have to be done uh, about that. Uh, it is not very, very well known today. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure I I'm completely convinced when you say that just by the fact that there are, for example, 20 species in, instead of five, we mm -hmm. have more adaptation <coughs> slash survival chances. Uh, because isn't that too generic a statement to make? Because, well, yes, sure. I mean, of course, um, the odds are better when, let's say, on a fraction, the numerator is 20 instead of five, but it also has to do with how many favorable outcomes you have out of that, right? What is the number of, let's say, nitrogen-producing species? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's sure. three out of five. No, no, of, of course, of course. Of so. No, you are right. Uh, this is exactly what I said before. And if you look at the facilitation effect, for example, you, you are, we are exactly in what you say. It's a general rule. But of course, in the real world, it's a little bit more complicated. The identity of species is very um, important, of course. But nevertheless, the number in itself has concrete consequences, despite the identity, the characteristic, and so on of the different species. You, you can also have sometimes a situation where we have two species Uh, in the, voilà, absolutely. It's also possible, yes. But statistically, what we have seen today is that the positive global effect uh, is more frequent uh, than the negative one. Bon, we have also some more. Uh, I have no. Faut que je m'arrête, hein, j'imagine. Ça va encore? Bon. Voilà. A, a fantastic study about pests in forest uh, in US. 70 species of trees, uh, and we measure the diversity of pests. We see that for a low number, or low number, until 35, in France, 35 species, it's quite impossible to, to observe. Bon. <coughs> But for a low number of trees, if you increase the number of trees, you increase the diversity of pests, and after 35 or something. Uh, something like that. Species, you decrease the diversity of pests. This is something that has been demonstrated a long time ago. This is a dilution effect. When you have 70 species of trees in a forest, compared to a situation where you have 10, for example, uh, 50, uh, the distance between two individuals belonging of the same species is larger. And so, 
the path has to jump <laughs> a long distance to arrive at another tree of the same species. This is a dilution effect. And it has been shown also in crop fields with rice in China. The situation is very simple. You have rice uh, susceptible to uh, fungi. You have a variety of this rice resistant to this fungi. The ecological theory says, OK, you mix all that, and it will be very good. You will have a good resistance to uh, the pest. Of course, mixing different varieties is not so simple, because uh, I don't know, the, the fruit are not ready exactly at the same time. Uh, the height of the fruit are not exactly at the same level. So it will be very complicated to, to make um, uh, the harvest. Merci. Mechanical harvest. We are not going to pick <laughs> the different uh, grains uh, one by one. So in this case, you degrade the op ecological uh, uh, optimal theory. And you say, OK, you make some wrongs with a variety susceptible to the pest, and one rank over five or four, I don't know, you put one <coughs> variety resistant. And doing that, you decrease uh, the uh, susceptibility to the pathogen by 90% more or less, and you increase the productivity by the same number. Once more, when the pest is here, it has to jump over the resistant rank, and it's complicated. And in this case, we had uh, four treatment teacher by uh, pesticides. And now we have only one treatment teacher. So uh, the rule should be for agriculture, mix different varieties. You will get a resistance against, uh, against uh, pests. It's clearly. We have many results now. Of course, sometimes we have it doesn't work. Huh? All what I say are general rules. But sometimes, one time over 10, it doesn't work because we have special conditions. All the rules, as usual, express depending on the local condition, of course. And you have to take into account the local condition. Boom. Alors, just a few words about interaction between climate and biodiversity. Something funny is that climate change is due to the increase of CO2 in the atmosphere. Okay. Good news for trees, because trees belong to uh, uh, the C C3 photosynthetic pathway. And trees need more or less two times more nitrogen to fix their, their CO2 than for C4 plants. Uh, See, for plants, are grasses uh, very often. And so, in fact, in the present condition, with uh, uh, 420 ppm of CO2, something like that at the moment, in fact, the trees lack of CO2. They cannot express all their potential of growth with this level of CO2. And you, if you make experiments, you see that the good level of CO2 for trees, on average, is between 700 and 900 ppm. So the prediction is that, of course, good news, more CO2, more tree growth, more carbon sequestration, everything is perfect. And if you look at the results uh, in different uh, big experiments, when we put trees over 10 or 15 years, with a high level of CO2 in natural conditions, uh, you see the cost of the, uh, the experiment. Well, uh, yes, we observe an increase around, uh, I don't know, uh, why, 23% increase of the rate of growth of the trees compared to the situation with a normal concentration. So very, very good. But there is no miracle. But, but, but. This is a short time. Uh, it, this is not a long, uh, a long process, a long time process. Uh, normal situation, 
elevated uh, situation, more carbon here. And you see that after six or seven years, the difference between the two situations is going to decrease at the end. There is no more difference between the, the, tree, the tree growth in high CO2 compared to the tree growth in low CO2. And yes, uh, living organisms are not only made of carbon. They are, only, they are also made of nitrogen and phosphorus. So if you increase the uptake of CO2, you increase the demand in nitrogen and phosphorus. And of course, rapidly, uh, you decrease the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus available in the soil. And so you create a limitation by nitrogen and phosphorus. And this is the reason why some, for me, mad guy, say, no problem, we are going to put fertilization in the forest. But we do that. Huh? In the southwest of France, we put phosphorus in the forest, in the forest, in the plantation. Well. But it will not be also a solution because I'm sure that if, if we bring nitrogen and phosphorus, okay, but you will have a new limit. I don't know. Potassium or molybdate, iron, I don't know. So it is not so simple to, to manipulate uh, forest to, for carbon sequestration. It's possible, but in, if you want to have a, a clear carbon sequestration, you have to, we, we, I don't know if you have a, a conference on that, uh, geoengineering, in fact. No. Manipulation of our, uh, And you don't exactly know what you do because we are on a complex system, and so on. <laughs> Um, there are some natural response of biodiversity that are not positive for us. Uh, if you look at uh, what is happening at, in the north area of the continent, um, in the uh, north uh, hemisphere, the forest is developing, uh, more and more forest. Good news? Well, no, not good news, because uh, if you have not forest, you have tundra, something with a vegetation very clear, uh, uh, yellow, white, etc., with a good albedo, uh, this capacity of the cover to reflect <coughs> energy. And the snow during a long period of the, of the year, very high albedo also. If you have more trees, you have less uh, snow, you have a dark cover compared to the tundra cover. So you lose a lot of albedo. Of course, you sequester carbon. You have a small evaporation, uh, transpiration of, uh, of the trees. You know probably that transpiration is a key point also for the cooling of atmosphere. But of course, in cold areas, the transpiration is, is low. So if you make the balance of all that, of this tree determinant of climate, CO2, uh, transpiration, evaporation, and uh, albedo. The loss of albedo is too strong. The balance is negative. And we, uh, the scientific consensus at the moment is that this response, positive response of forest to climate warming is negative uh, if we take into account the global warming of the atmosphere. So, this is also a very big problem for uh, uh, climate scientists who make big models to, to predict uh, the evolution of climate because they have to take into account this type of reaction, typical of a system once more. And uh, it is not sure that at the moment we, we know uh, really all the retroaction, <coughs> the feedback of life on this climate change. So forests are able to sequester carbon, that's true, but they are able also in some area to decrease uh, the albedo, uh, et cetera. I said before that, of course, uh, plants, plants and all organisms modify their uh, close environment. Paris, uh, Le Bois de Vincennes, uh, urban forest, 
we were in 2003, the first big uh, uh, heat peak in France. Uh, oh, it, well, we had between 15 and 17,000 people who died in, uh, in three, three weeks. The rate of mortality in Paris was uh, two times higher during these uh, three weeks. Huh? Big impact. But at in the morning, you have eight degrees between the temperature in the forest compared to the temperature in some areas of Paris. And this is the reason why we say put trees uh, in the street. Uh, it's a first response, efficient response to the warming. Um, je passe, je passe. Just a small model for uh, a common situation. You have a narrow street with trees on the two sides. Uh, you can see that, uh, for example, if you look at the air temperature as two meters, this is the temperature we, we, we feel, uh, you can have at some moments between far away, around eight degrees less in the street. So in fact, well, uh, when I see what happens in the area in the region in the France where we we destroy big trees to build more and more and more. Uh, when you see that, you see that when you have trees, uh, green roofs, green walls, etc., you save life. It's a public health policy to put vegetation in your urban area. It is not just uh, to sequester <coughs> carbon or because you are an ecologist. No, it's also something very important for, for public health. <coughs> and really, when you see what happens each day in the area, you should invite them uh, to, to this course. Ils pichent pas, ils ne pichent pas. Bon, of course, if you want to have this cooling effect of trees, or cooling effect, why? Because they intercept, of course, solar radiation, and because they make transpiration. It's a physical process, and when you change uh, water in a liquid state to water in a vapor state, you consume energy, so you have a cooling effect. Okay. But the fuel of this cooling effect is water, so we need water. And in the streets, it is not so evident. And we had made in the lab a, a study of the isotopic composition of uh, carbon in the leaves, uh, this is the isotopic composition is driven, driven by uh, the, other, the accessibility of water in the soil. So I don't go into the details, but the results are clear. In the street, bah, we have uh, a water stress for the trees. So the cooling effect of the trees is not maximum because there is not enough water. So this theory of uh, uh, I don't know how to say that, disimpermeabilization. Well, you have concrete everywhere, you have to, <laughs> to destroy this concrete everywhere. Uh, and it works. I, idem, uh, voilà, bon. Well, so maybe I, I stop there. Uh, bon. Cities may be very, f uh, also, uh, may be positive for biodiversity. If you take the example of the city of Paris, one uh, of the high density cities in the world, no? so, well, you have more than one and two thousand, one and one thousand and two hundred species of plants in Paris. Idem for the animals. Uh, you have many birds, nesting birds, etc. And it's normal because in a city, in a very small area, you have many, many different environments. So you can have coexistence of many species that normally do not coexist. And so uh, very often uh, when we study that in, uh, in cities, we, we speak of neo-ecosystems. Well, they are more or less unstable, of course, huh, because the we have a high diversity, uh, high number of species, but very often with low uh, abundance, low number of individuals. So they are more or less uh, Unstable. Voilà. Bon.
thank you for your attention. I'm sorry for the English. Questions? Yes. Discussion. Voilà, répondez-vous. <laughs> Can we go back to your slide, please? Oui. Uh, you talk about carbon emission. You know, you need carbon for the tree flow or something. Ah, uh, for the forest? Yes, please. And my question is, is there is a feeling that uh, trees are uh, reducing, helping to, to, to mitigate climate change, yeah? Yeah. And how many trees do we need? Alors, if I remember, Or any if we, right. Alors, if we put forest where we had before forest, yeah. we could save, if I remember, something around uh, 70 ppm of CO2. So it is not enough, of course, but it should have a significant impact. The question is, of course, that if we have destroyed the forest, it is to develop agriculture. And for me, we speak a lot of forest, forest, forest. Uh, really, now it's a new miracle for me. No, the big question is for the uh, agriculture. Because in agriculture today, uh, we, of course, produce uh, gases, of course. But we also destroy the organic carbon in the soil. We lose fertility. But what does it mean we destroy carbon in the soil? That means that we em emit a lot of CO2. Also. And so when you take into account the, the, the total surfaces of the crop fields huh, and grasslands, it is, uh, if I remember, 37% of the continental area including the area covered with ice. Okay? If you take into account only the continents without ice, we are around 45%, something like that. So the key point is to reduce the surface of the agriculture in order to create new areas for forest, new areas for biodiversity. And another point, the key point, is to change the management of crop fields in order to make the crop fields able to sequester carbon and to stop the emission of carbon. It should be possible. It depends on the, of the management of plant residues. Now, plant residues, residues, awful. Huh? In ecology, it doesn't uh, exist uh, residues. Uh, now we say, no, ah, we are going to, to use uh, plants, uh, agriculture, residues, Uh, residues in forest exploitation to create uh, oil, uh, to create uh, energy. It's a very bad idea because what is the problem with agriculture and with forest? The problem is that you export matter. In natural conditions, there is no export of matter. There is recycling of matter. Since as soon as you export something, you will decrease the balance between input and output of carbon So you will decrease the total amount of carbon stored. But of course, with agriculture, we have an obligation to export, of course. But we export more. Or if we have to export, we can uh, balance this export by an import of organic matter com coming from cities, etc. We can increase the content of carbon in the soil If we uh, keep the straw in the field. But today we export the straw from the field. And even if we put the straw in the soil, normally it should be positive. But it is not so sure. In my lab, we have done works on that, uh, we have made experiments. It's very simple to understand. Do you know the age of carbon in the soil? In, right, the, the age of the carbon, the organic carbon, the humus in the soil. If you take the common situation in temperate areas, the age is between 100 and 1,000 years. That's strange. You have 
organic matter in the soil, and you have a lot of organisms in the soil, in one gram of, of soil, you have 100 million of bacteria. You have one kilometer of fungi. So you have a lot of life in the soil. You have a lot of, a lot of organic compounds that normally they consume. And this matter stay during 100 years or 1,000 years. Something doesn't work. In fact, it's very simple to explain. When you look at the uh, molecular structure of the organic matter in the cell, it is very complex. What does it mean? That means that a bacteria, when these bacteria attack, degrade this carbon in the soil, the cost of this degradation, because you have to produce a lot of enzymes, etc., because we have a complex molecule, the cost is very high, and this cost is not compensated by the gain of energy through the metabolism, the metabolism of, the, of the bacteria. So we have an, ed an energetic problem. The cost to uh, benefit from this organic matter is too high. So the bacteria stay. When you look at the microorganisms in the soil, at every moment, they, they do nothing. They, stay, well, they wait, but they wait what? <laughs> But they, they have a problem of energy. So they wait energy. Where does this energy come? Come from the root, the living root. Yes, a plant, a living plant, put energy in the soil through its root. What is energy? It's sugar, small molecules. So you have a, a, a supply of energy by the root. The bacteria are happy. They took this energy and they degrade the organic matter in the soil. But when you, you put straw in the soil, what do you do? But what, what we have in the straw? In the straw, we have fructose, glucose, small molecules, very energetic. Look, in laboratory condition, it is demonstrated, there is no discussion about that. If you do that, you stimulate the microorganisms in the soil, and so you emit more CO2. So, voilà. The, once more, uh, we have to be very careful because we act on a system and there are many things we don't know in the system. And behind this response of bacteria to energy and so on, we have problems of competition between different types of, uh, of bacteria. Well, so you, for, you, you, you forget that, it's too, it's too complicated, but it is just an example showing that uh, sometimes good solutions are not so, well, maybe bad solutions. We can have maladaptation when we manipulate an ecosystem without any knowledge or any uh, uh, modeling, uh, any different scenarios we can test and, and so on. We have to be very careful. Uh, and really, the problems we have today with agriculture it is just because we have, not do, we have not done that. In agriculture, we have said, okay, we are going to increase the, productive, the production. We are going to do what we have to do to increase this production. We have manipulated the system, but with a one component view uh, of the system. And so, of course, we have some uh, side effects by definition, in a complex system. And these side effects are very complicated now. And we have, uh, we have changed the agriculture, what is the most important activity of uh, humanity. Uh, we have transformed this agriculture in an ecological catastrophe. So, so, bit, bon. so for me, the key point is agriculture. Oh la la. Bon. I, I have but you can discuss to you. <laughs> <laughs> My question is regarding, you had a slide about the cost of production of rice yeah. and it reduced when there was a mixture. Yeah. And I was wondering if that is for lots of agricultural commodities. Because I come from Brazil, where it's a region where we are destroying uh, diversity to put put oh. only soybeans, which are monoculture. So I was wondering if this uh, is, if you know, if, if this depends on what is being produced. So for example, if rice, okay, but what about the other products, other 
Are they, do they also ah. increase the physical yield of? Uh, I don't know. They, okay. uh, <laughs> we have no. I, I have no data on that. I don't okay. know. Wait. Thanks, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll Google a well. <laughs> Hello, Bishop. May I, because I'm staying with the soils, uh, I would be interested. So I understand that biodiversity is very important for soil yeah. and soil fertility. Mm -hmm. um, and is there any not OK? So and I would claim that, like, Climate change in and of itself is not a risk of human extinction if we just talk about temperature or sea level oh. rise. This is, I would say, manageable, but how do you assess the risk that fertility in soil decreases so much that human life becomes unsustainable? Wow. Uh. Well, the answer is, uh, well, the question is very difficult in itself. But for me, it's more difficult because <laughs> uh, I have also maybe uh, a different view of soil fertility. And this is uh, the result of the studies I have done in very difficult areas. In fact, uh, when I was a scientist, uh, I'm not a technocrat, um, like now, um, I worked on the carbon and natural cycling in savanna ecosystems. These savanna ecosystems in West Africa, very uh, common system. You have sandy soils. You have 0.7 percent of the soil under the form of carbon, very low. You have no nitrogen, you have annual fire, and when you measure the productivity, the annual productivity, and this system exists probably since the last uh, glacial period, since uh, uh, 18,000 years at least, we have among the highest annual productivity in the world. We have 40 tons of dry matter produced each year on a sandy soil without nitrogen, with fire, four months of dryness, and so on. So that's very strange. <coughs> and after uh, 50 years, in fact, of works, my works, but the works of other colleagues from Switzerland, from many countries, we have no explanation. In fact, this is what I, I tried to, to, to show you before. We have a very constraining environment for plants. OK, the plants have taken the control of the environment. The soil is poor. There is nothing in the soil. No problem. The plants create some sort of islam of organic matter. The organic matter is concentrated just under the plant. For example, if you look at the roots of the plant, if you do that in the grassland uh, beside uh, this building, you will find more or less a regular distribution of roots. If you, root, if you look at the roots <laughs> in this environment, all the roots are in a small volume of soil. You say, but it's mad. There is a high density of roots in a small volume of soil. They do not go into other parts of the soil. So there is a very strong competition. Yes, but. The dead matter of these plants, when it is decomposed, it produces nitrogen and phosphorus and so on. And immediately, you have a living root just beside, and this is taken, and it goes directly in the plant. Another incredible point, and it was very complicated to publish that at the beginning. If you look at nitrate, you know what is nitrate. Nitrate is something that pollutes water. But why it, it pollutes water? It pollutes water because it is very mobile in the soil. It is due to the electric uh, uh, charge, which um, is But when you go to school, you learn that uh, plants uh, grow on nitrate there. We put nitrate in the in, in crop field. But there is no nitrate. There is no nitrate, and we have 40 tons of matter produced each year. 
where is this nitrogen? But in fact, we have shown that plants produce compounds that inhibit bacteria that produce nitrate. So you have no loss at all of nitrogen. When you look at the distribution of, in space of plants, we, saw, we see uh, also some incredible things. We saw some cooperation between roots of trees. This is maybe your answer, your question. We see also a collaboration between trees and grasses and so on. So in fact, the, yes, this soil is poor, but plants through evolution have evolved some characteristic physiological, morphological, etc., and they create their own positive environment. So the practic practical conclusion, when I say, or when people say, this soil is fertile and this one is not fertile, I do not understand what does it mean if we don't explain what is the type of plant cover on the soil. In fact, as soon as you have a plant on the soil, you create a system. And the system with uh, impact and feedback. And so to understand and to decide is of if a soil is good or not, we have to take into account uh, this system soil, soil plant. And this is one reason uh, that for me, uh, the response to your question is much more complicated because for me, uh, really I believe that the soil and the plant is a, a single system, only one system. <coughs> well, uh, but in tropical forests, it is the same situation. Uh, why is there, have we a problem in Amazonia, for example, when we destroy forest? Well, we have a problem because we destroy forest, we destroy biodiversity and so on, we emit carbon, okay? <laughs> but also, we destroy the system I have described before. Because in fact, when you look at forest, the roots are not in the soil. It's wrong, it's wrong. The roots are in the dead organic matter that is decomposing. <coughs> because this dead organic matter that is decomposing is producing phosphorus, nitrogen, and so on. In a tropical forest, you have roots, living on dead roots, in a small layer of soil, uh, five centimeters, 10 centimeters, and under, you have nothing. <coughs> so in fact, the trees create a, a, a closed circuit of nutrients. And this is the, the, the fuel, this closing of uh, nutrients is uh, the, the explanation, the fuel, in fact, of this productivity. But if you destroy the forest, you want to make a crop field. This is what they do in, in Brazil, they also in Africa and so on. It works two, two years, three years, and after that, it's finished. Yes, because the fertility is not produced by the soil alone. The fertility is produced, in fact, by <coughs> this recycling of nutrients by the plants themselves. If you destroy the plant, you destroy the system. So you have an empty soil with nothing. So OK, it works uh, one, two years, three years. And after that, it's finished. <laughs> and what is funny is that in some area in South America, uh, they have imported some grasses from Africa to start this new process uh, with the hope that after a certain time we can eventually uh, put uh, new trees. So it's very complicated, uh, this concept of soil uh, fertility. Really, uh, it's a system. And this is a very interesting result of ecology as a science that in fact we, we discover every day uh, this any questions uh, remain just to see one, two, three. Three questions together. And then sort of the champagne. So we collect the three questions. Yeah. Uh, when we were talking about uh regarding all the, the biodiversity policies, you were talking of biodiversity as a whole. But as far as I know, until the 70s, 80s, the um, important dominant bi biodiversity policy was single species conservation. Mm -hmm. Like 
you know, save the tiger and all that nonsense, yeah. Uh, so that kind of policy actually ignored complex feedbacks and it also caused a lot of social injustice because of enclosing of plants. So is that kind of policy today considered completely outdated science? Or no, uh, that's complete. Other oh, pardon. <laughs> okay, we take the three um, questions. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the two others, yes, okay. Um, I was just wondering whether you think we should aim for putting a monetary value on biodiversity or not? Uh, economic value, you mean? Yeah, like a monetary value. Yeah. yeah. And the yeah. Last yes, one. I have a good thing because uh, main biodiversities are disappearing in deserts. And if you talk about innovation, there is already created ways, for instance, water bad that allows to keep water in desert, for instance, innovation made by uh, plastic that allows to keep water in desert and doesn't allow to uh, dry up. But there is no funding for such projects. Why your institutions cannot rise and support such projects which allow to provide this biodiversity? Bon. <laughs> Alors, si je me rappelle... Yeah. Comment J'ai déjà oublié la première question. Three questions, three minutes, or... uh, je ne sais pas quoi répondre là. Yes. Comment Oui, le, le single, species. single species versus uh, all system. Bon, of course, things are changing. And uh, measuring species, it's quite easy. Measuring, for example, the complexity of a system, since we, we believe that this complexity in itself is something important. Uh, I am not sure, as a scientist, I am not sure to be able to tell you how we could measure this complexity. There is a problem of scientific knowledge. There is a double problem. There is a, a problem of scientific knowledge in itself, and there is also a problem of communication of this scientific knowledge. If I come back to this complexity, we don't know to measure complexity. OK, but maybe we could measure some proxy of complexity. For example, within the whole complexity, there is a complexity of food web, as we have seen before. Complicated to measure the food web. Measuring the complexity of, of food web is not possible. Yes, but there is something we can do we can measure the number of trophic levels. Plants, grazers, uh, carnivores, carnivores too, etc. And we know today that if you measure the natural abundance of nitrogen 50 <laughs> in a top predator, you have a picture, a proxy, of the number of trophic webs. So what I believe, but I, it's a belief, if we were able to measure this nitrogen 15 in top predators, we could describe a part, only a part, of the complexity. But it would be a first step of this complexity. And of course, this complexity of food web is linked to the total complexity. Well, so there are many examples of that. We could uh, measure some proxy of complexity, etc., mm -hmm. etc. Et when I speak of uh, heterogeneity, heterogeneity in a forest uh, with a, a satellite and so on, it's not very complicated to measure the heterogeneity in space or forest. So I think really that many things are possible. Very often the knowledge in science is not enough, but in fact it's, it is just a question of uh, way of uh, exp explanation of the scientific results and to accept to make some approximation. Uh, well, but I'm sure we can do best. Some people try to do that. Uh, for example, for, for carbon sequestration in forests, uh, people try to take into account some proxy of biodiversity. For, for example, in forests, they count the number of big trees, of dead trees, and something like that. I think we are, uh, we are at the beginning uh, of the process. Alors, the question was... 
suis complètement oublié. Ah, voilà, ça. Euh... Si, si, je vais apporter une réponse, parce que si, si mes cœurs, if my colleagues listen to me, je, I will be in trouble. Uh, I am not against the, evalu the monetary evaluation of, uh, of biodiversity. I know that the techniques we have to evaluate this value are far from um, perfect, very far. But there, is two, enfin, there are two reasons. Uh, first, when we speak of money, we speak of, co of a common language. Every, everyone is able to understand the language of money. If I explain all that, to, well, it's quite complicated. So there is a common language. And after that, uh, it's also a, a way to explain uh, why biodiversity is so important. And also, we need money to protect biodiversity and so on. So, well, There is a big risk. The big risk is to take into account only this uh, economic value. And this is a real risk because we have a number. It's easy to have a number. How can I give a number for that? I cannot give a number. So this is, for me, the main risk. We have something very precise. It's not really precise, in fact, but with the appearance of something precise, a number everybody can understand. It's simple, and me, I have a complex, uh, <laughs> uh, I have complex explanation, I, uh, and I am not able to give a single, a single value. Well, oh. I'm not very convinced. <laughs> and the last question was, c'était quoi déjà votre question? C'était quoi? Ah oui. Le, Uh, the, the technical solution to, to keep water? No, it's no. already available, but there is no funding. There is no funding? Ah, well, well, well. <laughs> the economist is there. <laughs> Why institutions don't want to fund? Comment? Institutions don't want to fund such projects. No, but uh, just before I, I had another meeting, I have seen the, <laughs> the global evaluation of the money we put in nature-based solution and so on. It's so small. People do not understand the situation. There is not enough money uh, about that. They don't want to, to find that. It's But, bon. I have no power in this domain. Thank you very much. Bon, merci. Merci.